traveling through women's history, one era at a time. I'm Kate Armstrong. In part one of our exploration of an ancient Roman woman's day, we learned a bit about our empire's history, went to the ladies' room, got ourselves dressed, done up, and ready for the day. Now, let's descend the stairs and explore our house or domus. But first, a shout out to some of my patrons. My pirate queens, Anna, Becky, Chloe, Emily, Gaia, Jackie, Jessica B, Kayla, Mikkel, Morgan, Olivia, Sarah, Stephanie, and Wendy. And my lady presidents, Amanda, Amy, Brendan, Audrey, Belinda, Caroline, Cassie, Claire, Courtney, Courtney H, Dana, Debbie, Diana, Edie, Elizabeth M, Elizabeth G, Elspeth, Ellie, Eve, Jeanette, Jessica S, Caitlin, Karen R, Casey, Kat, Kelly, Kelly F, Kim, Larissa, Lauren, Lori, Louisa, Mary, Meg, Nancy, Nicole, Paul, Pamela, Sasha, and Townsend. And to the Imperators and Augustas who donate more each month than I've asked for, Avery, Karen C., and Jackie C. Becoming a patron really helps keep the show going, and you'll get access to sneak peeks, discounts on merch, and exclusive bonus episodes. To find out more, just go to my website. The vast majority of Romans live in apartment blocks called insulae, which we'll walk by a little later, but we're lucky to live in something a little more luxe. Our house is fashioned like a Greek home, built around a central, rectangular atrium that is open to the sky. This pretty open space lets light in, but also rain that filters through a bunch of terracotta pots and figures along the funnel-like roofline, and tumbles down into a central pool. When it pours rain, it's going to be hard to hear yourself think up in here. The water goes down into a cistern, which will serve as your water source for most of your daily needs. It's smart design, and it looks pretty, too. Our house is quite sparse in terms of decoration. As a rule, no lavish furniture here. The walls and floors, though, give us plenty to look at. They are covered in colorful murals and frescoes. We Romans do not approve of fresh white walls. I hope you aren't yearning for quiet time alone in your new home, because Roman domestic life is most certainly shared. You'll be dealing with your kids, guests, probably extended family members. And like it or not, as a wealthy matrona, you are assuredly going to be dealing with slaves. They are a prevalent feature of life here, and are, alas, something we cannot avoid. All life here is defined by social status rather than ethnicity or skin color. And if you're a slave, you're at the absolute bottom of the totem pole. Many slaves come from places Rome has conquered, sold into slavery after their side lost. Some are stolen and sold into slavery by pirates. Seneca the Elder paints a disturbing picture. Naked, she stood on the shore, at the pleasure of the purchaser. Every part of her body was examined and felt. Would you hear the result of the sale? The pirate sold, the pimp bought, that he might employ her as a prostitute. Others come from Rome itself, forced to sell themselves because they can't pay their debts. Most slaves are born free, and we Romans are very aware that it is an unfortunate state that can befall almost anyone. That doesn't always mean they are treated kindly. There are a lot of slaves in Rome. By the first century BCE, they make up about 20% of Italy's population. The good news is that they can be very influential in our households if they earn their family's faith and trust. Some are eventually freed, and for those whose family or sponsors are citizens, they can adopt the same status. Others are less fortunate, sold into hard labor, prostitution, to fight as gladiators, or are shipped out to large country estates, where the work is pretty grueling. When it comes to how they're treated, it's a family affair. The law doesn't much intervene. Your husband gets to decide how to treat those subjugated under your roof, and so do you. This is an ugly reality, but in a pre-industrial age, slaves are quite literally keeping this empire running. So make sure you're extra nice to the women cleaning and cooking around you, and tell your son that, no matter what his friend says, he is not entitled to sleep with any. 
As the mater familias, or head woman of the family, you are in charge of managing the household. We will oversee the education of our children, plan dinners, preserve our house's honor, and generally share whatever respect our husband earns. You have power within these walls, and no mistake. But when it comes to who truly runs your world, your pater familias has more power than you ever will. In ancient Rome, our pater familias is very much in charge of us. Here's Dr. Evans to explain why. The pater familias is really, it's, he's almost a god in the household. It's something that I tell my students often is that Rome is the most patriarchal society I can think of, not because it's the most heavy-handed against women, but because patriarchal literally means the rule of the father. And for the Romans, the father was the leading figure in any household. And that household isn't confined to some nuclear family. He will usually be the oldest man of uh, maybe a quite extended family. And there might be adopted children, there might be nieces and nephews whose father have died. So it might be more than just his children and his wife that he is literally the ruler of. He's also the priest of the household, which means he carries out any rituals that need to be done at home. He'll just pull up the hood of his toga and boom, instant priest. He manages the money, strikes deals, and decides whom all his children will marry. Rome's very first legal code, the Law of the Twelve Tables from 450 BCE, puts women directly under the control of their pater familias. Because really, we're too feeble-minded to stand legally on our own. Women, even though they are of full age because of their levity of mind, shall be under male guardianship. That's our problem, ladies. Levity, which Merriam-Webster defines as excessive or unseemly frivolity, or a lack of steadiness. Thanks a lot, ancient men friends. Of course, not everyone agrees. A guy named Gaius once said that, There seems to have been no very worthwhile reason why women who have reached the age of maturity should be in guardianship. For the argument which is commonly believed, that because they are scatterbrained, they are frequently subject to deception, and that it was proper for them to be under guardian's authority, seems to be specious rather than true. Someone get that gentleman a drink. The truth is that any of a paterfamilias' children, either male or female, are under his authority, and technically need his permission to do pretty much anything. Everybody in Rome, whether you're a man or a woman, has a paterfamilias an older male relative that has this kind of control, like has a certain level of control over them and their lives. And that control means that our father can do what he wants with us, whip, starve, or exile, if he so chooses. And while social expectation might intervene, the law probably isn't going to. Who runs the world? Dead. In Rome, there is no worse crime than killing your father. The punishment is that you'll be thrown into a sack with a dog, a cock, a viper, and an ape, beaten, and then thrown into the Tiber. That is a very unhappy sack indeed. But wait, what about our husband? What's his role in all of this? There was a time early on in Rome's history when our father transferred power over us directly to our husbands. Here's Dr. Evans. The Manus marriage seems to have existed, the Romans at least thought it existed in early Roman society, it seems to have still existed maybe in the mid-Republic, so we might be talking 3rd century BCE, and then it might have existed in exceptional circumstances. And what the Manus marriage means is that basically her husband becomes like her father to her. And the manus part of it, which means hand, is that she's given over to the kind of symbolic power of the hand of her husband. But by the mid to late Republic, and definitely by the time we get into Empire, that sort of marriage seems pretty rare. So it's Dad who runs the show, and this remains true for as long as he is living. If you want a divorce, a thing that isn't hard to come by in ancient Rome, with very few religious or social repercussions, you're going to have to ask Dad for permission. Doesn't matter if you're 30 and an independent woman, damn it! This situation has its potential pros and cons, and a lot of them will depend on what kind of father we happen to have. For instance, if your marriage isn't going well, you have a place to go, a financial and filial security blanket. I think that's probably better for women because, I, and maybe, maybe I just think that fathers would be kinder to daughters, which is certainly not always the case. 
if a marriage is bad, the father could drag her back into his family, as it were, and uh, he could then uh, arrange a better marriage for her. But it can also be bad, as dad can yank us out of our marriage any time he so pleases and launch us at another man if he thinks it'll be more advantageous. He still has the right over her dowry. So, for example, divorce is very common in Roman society, especially amongst Roman elites. So you're quite right that a father from an elite family might well decide, oh, I need to make an alliance with that family now. My daughter's going to get divorced and I'm going to marry her off to one of those sons. Uh, and as we'll see, technically she has to give acquiescence to any marriage. But again, you know, how, how much freedom she actually had in that will depend on the individual families uh, and there could be a lot of pressure put on her. The, similarly, the husband can just decide that he wants to divorce her and then she will go back to her father's household, probably. So it's like she never completely breaks away from her father's household. Alternatively, if you're widowed and want to marry again, dad has the power to prevent you. Quite famously, a tired and lonely Agrippina the Elder has to ask her much-loathed paterfamilias, the Emperor Tiberius, if she can marry again. And because he sees her as a threat to his power, he says no, and there's nothing much she can do about it. But here's another potential plus. If the paterfamilias, who might well be their father, dies, they might possibly be under their own law, as it's called, sui juris. So they might not be under the authority of their husband or their husband's father or the man in that family. So it is more complicated than just women are transferred around, although they are, and that the paterfamilias rules everybody in the household. Women are in a way in a sort of anomalous position in the household. And there's a series of laws that come into play during the reign of our first emperor, Augustus, that say that women who have at least three surviving children, and if you're of a lower class, four, you can legally be emancipated from father or husband. A baby bonus, as it were. She could conduct business under her own name. You know, she had, and the Romans are obsessed with legal business. They're obsessed with wills. She could do all of that and buy and sell, which Roman women, if they had property, they could kind of do anyway. Technically, it was always under guardianship. So they had somebody called a tutela, a guardian, who technically had to kind of approve any exchange of property. It might be another one of those categories whereby it's pretty unlikely the tutela would step in. But if you have obtained your legal freedom, you don't have to worry about it. We'll talk about that law and what it meant for women a lot more in another episode. For now, suffice it to say that while there are avenues to legal emancipation for women, the Potter Familius has the power to make it tough for us to operate independently. Though, as we'll see, these rules are probably somewhat subjective and very much dependent on the kind of tutela you have. So, if you've got a good tutor on your side, exactly, you should be exactly. able to get anything done. Yeah. Everything about your potential to do business as an elite Roman woman is constructed through the lens of the male relationship. Yes. And if you happen to have a good setup, um, <laughs> yeah. good in inverted commas, yeah. uh, you have as much freedom as just about anybody else. But all this talk of the patriarchy is wearying. Let's fortify ourselves with a little food. Our breakfast, or in attaculum, will feature certain staples, bread, honey, and milk. There might also be some fruit, cheese, even meat, but no coffee or tea. If you're anything like me, that caffeine headache you're certain to be getting is something you're just gonna have to suffer through. This isn't a major meal, and it will be eaten swiftly, as business for the day starts early. Speaking of business, let's join another of the most important men in our lives, our husband Marius. Now that he's had his leg hairs rubbed into submission, he's ready to start conducting what's called the morning salutatio. Friendship in Rome is complex. Favors are the main social currency, and it's all a complex game of who owes who. Later on, Marius might spend some of his morning going around visiting other people's houses, his patrons, so to speak, offering support and asking for favors. But since he's quite a big deal himself, most of the morning you'll see his clients showing up at your house looking for an inn to ask Marius' advice, strike deals, and maybe just kiss up. Rome is a world where who you know really matters, and these webs of patronage are the oil that keeps the Roman machine grinding along. In short, Husband Deer is looking to grease wheels and keep himself well-connected. His and your prosperity might depend on it. 
The first thing guests will see when they walk into your house is the vestibulum, a kind of mudroom. In a really nice home, it'll be a greeting space as well, laid out with fine mosaics that say things like greetings and beware of dog. Marius may even have some death masks of his forebears hung up in this space, as we're obsessed with our lineage. And maybe because nothing intimidates a visitor like a mask of a dead relative's face? As we watch Marius strut around in his toga, let's reminisce a bit about our Roman childhood and what got us here in the first place. We're lucky we made it to adulthood at all. The ancient world is rough on infants and mothers, and we think that something like 50% of Romans die by the age of five. As a girl, we were probably educated alongside our brothers, learning how to read and write. As fancy ladies, we may even have had a private tutor to teach us some Greek, which is, in our eyes, the height of sophistication. This is the great news about being an ancient Roman woman. Education isn't considered unattractive, quite the opposite. In his dissertations, first century BCE philosopher and jurist Gaius Musonius Rufus said, there's no reason why women shouldn't receive the same education. Trainers of horses and of dogs make no distinction between male and female in their training. Not the analogy I would have gone for, but I'm feeling your point nonetheless. When asked whether women should study philosophy, he said, Women have received from the gods the same ability to reason as men. It is not men alone who possess eagerness and a natural inclination towards virtue, but women also. Women are pleased no less than men by noble and just deeds, and reject the opposite of such actions. Preach, Gaius! Families with a reputation for an academic bent may even encourage their daughters to become intellectuals. But don't get confused. All this education isn't to help us get a job or anything. It's to make sure that we're engaging wives, that we can effectively manage our household, and because we play a major role in our children's education. As Dr. Evans says, They might not get exactly the same kind of education as men. Um, they're not being trained for the courts and in the Republic for political life, so they're probably not as trained in oratory, but we do know that there were female orators. We know their names. Um, uh, so they were able to do it. Uh, some of them engaged in philosophy. Though some men do think that too much education might make us pretentious, or even worse, look sexually promiscuous. Is she just really well-read, or a woman of the evening? It really is such a fine line. You and your brothers will have played games together growing up, with dolls, marbles, and perhaps with wooden horses on wheels. You would have worn clothes that clearly marked you out as children, including big amulets around your necks, meant to protect you from evil and let other people know that you aren't yet legal. Romans might be marrying young by our standards, but they draw a distinct line between child and adult. Though you weren't left to this childhood for long. Growing up, one thing you knew for sure is that you were always destined to get married. Marriage is considered a citizen's right. It doesn't apply to slaves, actors, or gladiators. And it's crucial because our primary role as Roman women is to have children and raise them up to be good citizens. Nothing matters more than that. Anyway, it's not like you could have just moved out and become a career girl. Not really an option for someone of our status. Or hang out around Dad's house being a drain on his financial resources. Not when we're the glue that can adhere families together so nicely. In the Roman web of patrons and palm greasing, we daughters are one of our father's most powerful tools. For Roman elites particularly, who are the people we know the most about, marriage is not about love, or particularly a woman's choice. It's all about creating alliances. As the paterfamilias, your father had the right to give you away to any man he saw as an advantageous match for the family. And given how young we are when we marry, it's quite possible that we'll have to marry several men during our lifetimes, and not often of our choosing. So get ready for some serious emotional whiplash. You would have been married quite young by our modern standards, probably in your teens, as young as 12. Though your average marriage probably happens closer to 17 or 18. What is an ideal wife supposed to look like, you wonder? What was Marius looking out for? Loyalty is important, as is restraint, obedience, childbearing hips, and virginity. 
All our young lives, our mother would have hammered home the importance of holding onto our pudicidia, or chastity, which is the most important thing you can bring with you into the marriage market. Your husband is extremely unlikely to be able to say the same. The pudicitia, chastity, is very important reputation-wise. For an elite woman, it's kind of everything. So she's either a virgin or she's been married before and maintained chaste chastity within that marriage, at least as far as anyone knows. The great ancient writers, as we've already discovered, also love a woman who is ready to sacrifice herself for the greater good. Take the story of Arya. When her husband is ordered to commit suicide by a tyrannical emperor, he hesitates, as one might. So she takes the knife right out of his hand and plunges it into her own chest, telling him, It doesn't hurt, Titus. And she's held up as this great exemplar. Can you imagine living in that kind of society where that's the woman you're meant to aspire to? <laughs> Good question, Dr. Evans. There's also a famous tombstone that describes an ideal woman for us. It says, in sum... There's a very famous tombstone which says, you know, this is a, not a beautiful monument, but it's for a beautiful woman. It tells you a little bit about her and it ends with the famous statement of she kept her home, she made wool, in other words, she spun wool. That's all. Goodbye. <laughs> so that kind of sums up what a woman should do, apparently. Here's another one from 3rd century Rome, in which a man named Paternus calls his wife Urbana, My sweetest, chastest, and rarest wife. She lived every day of her life with me with the greatest kindness and greatest simplicity, both in conjugal love and the industry typical of her character. I have so many questions. What's he mean by simplicity? Is he saying they had sweetly boring sex, or what? Either way, what's being highlighted here is that she wasn't a complicated woman or a wild one, and that made her all the much easier to love. What do these kinds of expectations do to the Roman woman's psyche? Are these simply the ravings of men that we can roll our eyes at, or are they bars that we feel pressured to rise to? It's pretty hard to say. Once our spouse Marius was selected, our actual marriage was a pretty easy bargain to strike. Once an auspicious wedding day was chosen, he led a bunch of his peeps over to our house, where we were getting ready. Our mother and slaves probably helped us slip on a tunica recta, a special white tunic belted with an elaborate knot called the Knot of Hercules. The hero Hercules is considered the guardian of wedded life, and only our new husband is allowed to unknot it later. Hopefully with his teeth, but who knows? We'll have done our hair in an elaborate wedding-specific style called seni crines, or six braids. The six segments of hair would have been parted with a spear, preferably one that's had blood on it at some point. We're not sure why, but this joining of violence, sexuality, and marriage feels somehow very Roman. We then slipped our feet into some yellow slippers and covered our faces with a saffron-colored veil, casting our entire wedding day in a haze of red. Once the ceremony was done and the paperwork signed, there was a feast and then a noisy procession to our new home. Many people joined in on this raucous street party, throwing nuts at us for good luck, singing sweet songs, and shouting some extremely lewd jokes. Our new husband or some attendants carried us over the threshold, as we Romans are very superstitious and tripping as we enter our new house would have been considered quite a bad omen. Marius might have handed us some fire and water, perhaps in the form of a torch and a cup, to mark our changed status. We were handed the keys to our new house, and from there... When she's married, she becomes what's called a matrona. We think even before she's had children, but that's got the Latin word mater built into it. So the expectation is that she will have children, and that's how she fulfills her role as a wife. Uh, she's also in charge of the household. So part of the marriage ceremony is she'll be handed over the keys to the household. So that means that she has a certain amount of authority within the household. Of course, some couples do marry for love, or at least find love within their union. Among the lower classes that are less concerned about creating dynasties, there are probably a lot more love matches. But even among the elite, love exists. Take Tiberius, Emperor Augustus's stepson, when he's adopted and lined up to become the next emperor. And as part of that process as being the kind of nominated heir, he is forced to marry Augustus's daughter, Julia. But to do that, he has to divorce his wife, Vipsania, 
And he did not want to divorce Vipsania. He's supposed to have been um, very annoyed by that and really resentful. And Vipsania, I think, was, according to Suetonius, she, she was also very much invested in that marriage. So this is a time when both men and women seem to have had affection for each other and the dynastic strategies could break that apart. How often it exists between man and wife isn't clear. But we do know that affection and devotion were the ideals because that's the kind of thing that's recorded on tombstones, which, you know, tombstones always record some kind of ideal which may reflect nothing of the reality, but still for it to be there at all means this is what people wanted to see in a marriage. All right, so they wanted this kind of meeting of minds, this, this affection between the, the man and the woman and the devotion. They also wanted, despite what we've been saying about divorce being easy, they wanted this idea that a woman in particular would only be married once. So there's this category called the uni vera, which is literally the one man woman. Um, and that means that you have, your husband might have died, but you refuse all other offers of marriage. There are several famous women who are so heartbroken by the death of their husbands that they refuse ever to get remarried. While not everyone would love a woman staying single, ancient Romans do respect this position. We idolize a uni vera, or one-man woman. I suspect that at least some of these women use their show of devotion as a means of staying independent, and if so, I say, good on them. Whether you love Marius or not, being married to a powerful man has its advantages. His glory is your glory, and his failings are yours, too. So what are we doing all day as Roman matrone? Since we're elite women, we're unlikely to be doing many chores ourselves. Weaving is a skill that we're expected to learn, but if we have money, we're unlikely to be doing much of it. We'll spend a lot of time tending to domestic issues, which is often an involved and complicated process that requires a high degree of organization and a head for business. We'll structure our day around what Marius is up to. During the morning salutatio, we'll deal with household matters, and then we'll throw on our pala and join him for some afternoon leisure time. But what jobs are we likely to see Roman women doing? Dr. Evans explains. Well, I think they were doing pretty much all the work that men were doing. Yeah, they did own businesses. They, they did run businesses. We even know of female gladiators. Right? There's a famous plaque to Achillea and Amazonia, as they're called on there. So there are female performers. They're, in, they're obviously in sex work. They're in all kinds of domestic work. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much... There, there are no jobs specifically closed off from them. It's really all about status um, rather than gender in Roman society. The law doesn't prohibit us from getting involved in business. Some wooden tablets found near Pompeii from the 1st century BCE offer evidence that women were both money lenders and borrowers. So while we think women often need a man to vouch for them on paper, we can certainly get some business done. This is a famous uh, woman we know of from Pompeii called Eumachia who had some kind of laundry business. The daughter of a brickmaker in Pompeii, she marries into a high-ranking family and uses her money to become a notable patroness, building all sorts of impressive buildings. One of them is in the city's forum, and it boasts a statue of her dedicated by the local Fuller's Guild. A landowner named Valeria Maxima, we think from the 1st century BCE, employed two female managers, Eucrotia and Cania Urbana, to run her property. Some wealthy women own quarries and take an active part in their running. In less elite circles, some women develop businesses to go along with their husbands. A found curse tablet tells us that Artemis the Gilder was married to Dionysius the helmet maker. They serve as midwives and wet nurses, and doctors as well. I'm really digging this particular tombstone, dedicated by a doctor to his loyal wife. You guided straight the rudder of life in our home and raised high our common fame in healing. Though you were a woman, you were not behind me in skill. Some even work as calligraphers and artists. In short, we ladies are doing quite a lot. Consider this too. It's quite likely that at some point our husbands are going to go off to war or on business journeys. Some 6 to 19 percent of Roman adult men are soldiers, rising up to 25 percent when things get messy. And though there are periods when foot soldiers aren't allowed to marry, there are plenty of military men who will be leaving their ladies behind and leaving us to take care of the family's fortunes. When the husband's away, the women will take care of business. 
while they're away, the, the person who's probably going to conduct their business is their wife, maybe their mother, maybe other members of the family. Um, and we know that Roman women were, were very talented in this area. For example, when Julius Caesar marches off to war for many moons, his wife Calpurnia takes care of all his assets in his absence. When our friend Ovid is exiled, his lovely wife works her contacts and her legal brain to ensure they hold on to their livelihood. During times of war, women often step up and make themselves that money, and they're not afraid to make noise when the government tries to take it from them. After Julius Caesar dies in 44 BCE, the triumvirate of guys who step up to lead in his place are all set to forcibly tax 1,400 rich women to help fund their civil war. When, much to their dismay, a woman named Hortensia, daughter of the orator Quintus Hortensius, steps up to the rostra to tell them exactly what she thinks about it. According to Appian, she argued, Why should we pay taxes when we have no part in the honors, the commands, or the statecraft for which you contend against each other with such harmful results. Damn, Hortensia. Mike drop city. She wins that day. The tribunes have to reduce the number of women taxed and tax some men while they're at it. But such female triumphs in the public sphere aren't common. For us ladies, our success in maneuvering through the world around us is to find subtle ways of doing business. Frugality and austerity are going to earn us much praise. Ambition and a naked desire to run the world? Not so much. So it's unlikely that you're going to find yourself a key player at the heart of Roman politics. Unless, of course, you're a Vestal Virgin. But before we join the Vestals, let's talk a little bit about religion in ancient Rome. Our religion is very much pantheistic. We have tons of deities imported from all different places through the empire. Many of our gods and goddesses came from Greece, rebranded with Latin names, Jupiter instead of Zeus, Venus instead of Aphrodite. As the empire grows, we see gods from further afield join their ranks. Eastern gods like Egypt's Isis and Persia's Mithras gain popularity, with cults and followers all over Rome. We have gods for all sorts of things, both large and small, from fountains to doorways. There's even a god of manure. You really drew the short straw there, Sterculius. Over time, some emperors and empresses are deified as well. The Pater Familius is the chief priest of our household, but we ladies are responsible for sacrificing to the gods in our new house on the day we get married and leave our family's nest. Men and women both participate in religious festivals, and we honor many gods, at least before monotheism spreads through the empire, which won't happen for quite a while yet. The gods are everywhere, in the house, in the market, always present, always to be respected. Every street in Rome seems to have some kind of shrine. As long as we keep the gods and goddesses happy with sacrifice, they'll protect us. Honoring them is less about actual belief than it is about respecting ritual. But that doesn't mean we aren't very superstitious, because boy are we ever. As young girls, we wore that amulet, called a lunula, primarily because it served as protection against the evil eye. As adults, we're very into astrology, and always on the lookout for signs and omens. A cockerel crowing at a party, a snake falling from a roof, you'd best get ready for misfortune. And if a priest happens to see a particularly vicious streak of lightning on the horizon, business might just grind to a halt for the day. With that knowledge, let's enter the world of the Vestal Virgins, six powerful priestesses who live at Rome's religious center. In a world where the religious and the civic are very much intertwined, they have more influence and potent significance than most Roman women will ever claim. But as we'll see, they pay a price for it. These priestesses honor the goddess Vesta, who we think comes from the Greek goddess Hestia, This virgin goddess lives in the hearth, dancing through every fire in Rome. The cult of the Vestal Virgins has been around for a long time, we think, since the early kingly days of Rome. Plutarch tells us that they were first set up by King Numa, who initiated the temple by choosing girls to become Vesta's special attendants. And they can only be women. That's key. 
Romulus and Remus's mother, Rhea Silvia, was herself a Vestal Virgin. Her legacy helps ensure that Vesta is associated not just with hearths, but with kings and emperors. The roaring fire of Rome's success. How exactly the Vestals are chosen is a murky issue, but a particular approach seems to evolve over time. There are always six Vestals, chosen between the ages of six and ten. If they've made it to six without perishing, then they're probably pretty hardy. But it's also crucial that they be virgins, and picking them so young will help to guarantee that. As Vestal expert Dr. G tells us, It's not just the age bracket that's important. They need to have both their father and mother living, mm. um, which might sound not that unusual to us, but is more unusual if we're thinking about mortality rates in the ancient world. Mm. Um, so both of them have to be alive. Importantly, she must be free from any impediment in her speech. This seems to be related to the ritual requirements of the mm. office of Vestal Virgin. If you're unable to pronounce uh, the ritual verses correctly, this means that they're not necessarily going to unfold appropriately. Mm. This means the Pax Deorum with the gods can fall by the wayside. This can lead to a whole host of issues, um, regardless of what priesthood you're a part of. Um, so their capacity for clear speech is a necessity. She has to be freeborn, never having been a slave, and she has to live in Italy. She can't have any significant marks or other signs of bodily imperfection. For a lot of Rome's earlier history, she has to come from a patrician family. This is a priestesshood of privilege. And of course, she has to be pure, aka a virgin. This is a very particular set of requirements and, you would think, quite a coveted position. But not everyone wants to volunteer their daughter to be a priestess. Why? Because you're signing them up for at least 30 years of service, which means no marriage, no children, and no sexy touching. That's not a duty to be taken lightly. Dr. G and Dr. Rad paint a picture for us. So the restriction is initially to daughters of patrician families, mm. so the elite of the elite. Mm. Um, but things become problematic for the Vestal Virgins as we get into the Augustan Principate. So we get a sense um, from Suetonius's Life of Augustus that there is an issue um, with families not putting forward daughters um, for what appears to be the lottery. They probably want them for political marriages, I'm guessing. <laughs> Quite possibly. Um, so the idea in the Augustan period, and we don't know how far earlier this particular tradition goes, the idea was that you would have a variety of applicants mm. and you would have a pool of, say, 10 or 20 young women offered as potential vestals. They'd all passed all of the physical restrictions. Yeah. They were all good to go. And then it was a matter of uh, an allotment. Mm. Um, to see who would get Kind chosen. of like the birthday lottery in the Vietnam War in Australia, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> or being selected as tribune in the Hunger Games. Yes, <laughs> I volunteer as tribute. We have an issue where not enough are coming forward, and Augustus gets really quite frustrated with this, and he comes out sort of all guns blazing, being like, look, if I had a granddaughter of the right age, I definitely would be putting her forward. That's how important this priesthood is. And everyone's like, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Easy said than done, Augustus. <laughs> But one family's reservations are another, less socially elevated family's potential gain. But this opens up some opportunities for non-patrician mm. families who are kind of like, well, it would still be a huge kudos for us to be able to say that we had a vessel in the family. Social climbing. All of a sudden, the equestrians are like, well, you know, uh, I, my, daughter, <laughs> my daughter is unblemished. Us too, us too. Look at me. Oh, yes, look at me. <laughs> and also daughters of free people. Yeah. Um, and they're like, well, uh, technically we're Roman. Those chosen are taken by captio, or a process of ritual capture by Rome's chief priest, or the Pontifex Maximus, who is often the emperor himself. So the Pontifex grasps the hand of the candidate and leads them away from their parents. And this signifies her shift from her natal family into this sort of family-less 
position as a priest that's serving Rome and mm. Rome alone. Being captured changes her status in a unique and very important way. As soon as she's led into the House of Vesta, she's no longer under the patria potestas, or patriarchal power, of her father. But it's not like when a woman gets married and experiences emancipatio, their sale into her new husband's family. She isn't tied to any man, but to the goddess Vesta. This I-don't-need-no-man freedom is a rare thing for anyone. And so the Vestals end up in this, what is legally this very weird space, where they're not beheld to this really specific power, which every other Roman finds themselves in relation to in some way. They live in the Atrium Vestae, a palace on the eastern edge of the Forum. It's quite luxe in many ways, though also known for being dark and damp. Not a place a ten-year-old is going to love spending a lot of her time. These women live in a sisterhood with Vestals of all ages, a very exclusive group indeed. The younger ones are initiates for the first ten years of service, looked after by the head priestess, or Vestalis Maxima. It's important to note that they aren't like old-school nuns, forever sequestered away behind the walls of their nunnery. They go to dinner parties and public functions, so while they may not be allowed to marry or even touch anyone for the full term of their service, it doesn't mean they aren't getting out and about. They do spend much of their days at the Temple of Vesta, which centers around a giant fire. Their most important job is to keep that sacred flame alive day and night, which they take in shifts, and to cleanse the temple with sacred water. They also make salsa mola, a bread and water mixture that is sprinkled throughout every religious ritual in Rome. They also look after secret talismans called the Fascinus, which is a sacred phallus. We're going to see phalluses all over Rome, so we'll talk about that a little more later. For now, let's focus in on Vesta's flame, because that flame is a symbol of Rome's health and prosperity, which means if it goes out, it is a sign that Vesta has stopped protecting us. In a superstitious city, that is a very bad thing indeed. Take the following drama. Around 178 BCE, a Vestal named Amelia got herself into a lot of trouble, as Dionysius of Halicarnassus tells us. The fire had been extinguished through some negligence on the part of Amelia, who had the care of it at the time and had entrusted it to another virgin, one of those who had been newly chosen and were then learning their duties. The whole city was in great commotion, and an inquiry was made by the pontiffs, whether there may not have been some defilement of the priestess to account for the extinction of the fire. The powers that be came to investigate. Seeing that she was in some truly deep horse dung, she stretched her arms up toward the altar and cried, O oh Vesta, guardian of the Roman city, if, during the space of nearly thirty years, I have performed the sacred offices to thee in a holy and proper manner, keeping a pure mind and a chaste body, do thou manifest thyself in my defense and assist me, and do not suffer thy priestess to die the most miserable of all deaths. But if I have been guilty of any impious deed, let my punishment expiate the guilt of the city. She tore off a piece of her linen and threw it up onto the cold and fireless altar. And what do you know? From the ashes of the fabric leaps a great flame. Was it Vesta or some kind of flint hid under her veil or something? Either way, a crafty woman saves the day. A Vestal's power lies in her continued dedication to the goddess, of which her virginity is an important part. Much like the Greeks, they have virgin goddesses who are powerful precisely because they don't engage in carnal activity. As Kelsey Dines explains in her thesis, which she kindly let me read, on virginity in the Greco-Roman world, Vesta's virginity allows her to be a kind of anchor, a stabilizing force that we see in her flame. This idea that a virgin is especially ritually potent seems to come from a belief that, as Kelsey writes, they have all this untapped energy that will leave as soon as they become sexually active. A Vestal's body is a symbol of purity. Her clothes mirror this. She dresses in many ways like a Roman matrona. She wears a stola and a headband called an infula. But then there are some very distinctive aspects to her outfit, including... A yeah. very, very particular style. It's called the Seni Crines style, which means basically six braids. And when we have a look at the portraiture sculpture that 
is extant for Vestals. You can often see a hint of it. Um, it's a bit tricky because it's often covered by other headwear. Um, but the, the six braids is considered a traditional hairstyle for a Roman bride, um, only to be worn on the wedding day. Mm. And this places the Vestals in this interesting visual position as constantly on the brink of marriage. Mm. Um, but they are in no way um, married. No. Um, definitely not. And they're kind of standing at this threshold between the potentiality of the adult female body to be married and always resisting it by remaining a virgin. Her virginity mirrors Vesta's, and here's the thing. It's also a stand-in for the purity of the state. If their body is penetrated, then it's like something could penetrate the state, like something bad could come in. (laughs) (laughs) The, The protective bubble has been burst. Your body is quite literally a temple, and so if anything happens to soil it, or just appears to, then Rome must be in serious peril. No pressure, ladies! So Vestals are wrapped in a kind of untouchable mystery that means they can pass through Rome's busy streets unmolested. To even brush one by accident is a horrible and punishable offense. Plutarch tells us that, He who passes under the litter under which they are born is put to death. So don't be offended if men see you coming and immediately run away. You don't smell bad, they just don't want to risk it. But that's not all. Plutarch also tells us that, When they appear in the public fasces are carried before them, and if they accidentally meet a criminal on his way to execution, his life is spared. But the virgin must make an oath that the meeting was involuntary and fortuitous, and not of design. So if a Vestal is to accidentally meet a second cousin in the street who's about to die, again, completely by accident, well, that's lucky. Some people even consider the Vestals magical. Pliny tells us that our Vestal virgins have the power by uttering a certain prayer to arrest the flight of runaway slaves and to rivet them to the spot, provided they have not gone beyond the precincts of the city. They are fascinating creatures, Plutarch says. They were also keepers of other divine secrets concealed from all but themselves. They're also some of the only women you'll see walking around with bodyguards. After a Vestal is accosted at a dinner party in the late Republican period, they're granted a lictor or a protector, who are only given to people with serious political or ritual importance. He leads her around while holding a fasces, which is a bundle of reeds with an axe hidden inside it. So even under the very rare circumstance that you just couldn't pick a Vestal out, say you just arrived at Rome from somewhere else, and you're like, who's that lady? She looks all right. She'd be hanging around most of the time in public with a bodyguard who is holding the fast gaze, um, clearing the way, making sure that everybody knows for sure <laughs> that this person has ritual... Yeah. Got an important package coming through. <laughs> Clear the way, people! <laughs> <laughs> ritual importance. Uh, there's no mistaking it. She's very important. Maybe don't touch her. This no-go zone is great for making sure you aren't jostled by any bad-smelling strangers, but it can also be used as a powerful tool. Cicero and others tell us that around 143 BCE, a Vestal named Claudia embraced her father while he's in the middle of his military triumph in the city to prevent him from being dragged from his chariot by his enemies. To grab him, they'd have to go through her, and nobody dares touch a Vestal. She put herself between the two with amazing speed, Valerius Maximus tells us, and so drove off a mighty power. The father led one triumph to the capital, while the daughter led another to the temple of Vesta. It couldn't be determined which of the two should be praised the more, he who had the victory by his side, or she who had the piety. A lady-led street party? I'll take it. And so we also see that, far from forgetting their families when they take the veil, Vestals can actually use their lofty position to help them. They definitely are tapped on the shoulder by their families to do certain things yeah. um, and to behave in certain ways or to take certain positions on issues. Um, so they do become politicized. Their powers and position have Vestal virgins hovering in an almost genderless state, granted privileges that many men can't lay claim to. Unlike other Roman women, they can operate without a tutor, that man who signs business documents and contracts for us. 
They can also own property and can make their own wills, which means they sometimes become independent repositories for their family wealth. They can give not only written evidence in court, but also testify themselves without being obliged to swear an oath. They even get Vestal Virgin VIP seats at festivals and the Coliseum. And special seats in the theater. Hey, front row. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because everybody wants to see the bloodlust uh, exactly. a lot closer, particularly you want, virgins. Yeah, you want the blood to be hitting your clothing. <laughs> <laughs> this is the closest I'm going to get to excitement all day, guys. Yeah. <laughs> and they even drive around in their own carriages. Say what? And if they join up young and decide to leave after their 30 years is up, it's quite possible they'll be walking away wealthy and independent. They can marry or they can decide not to. Either way, they can run their own affairs in ways most Roman women can't. But this state and their importance also makes them vulnerable. If the empire is going through an unstable time, a plague, say, or some other kind of instability, the powers that be might start pointing toward the Vestals as the source of the issue. The war is not going very well for Rome, and there seems to be no other earthly explanation. <laughs> Maybe it's Vestal's fault. Maybe. They really are walking a tightrope here, as Plutarch writes. If these Vestals commit any minor fault, they are punishable by the high priest only, who scourges the offender. And given that these women have a lot of privilege, they might spark jealousy and anger, so it's easy to see how they could be turned into scapegoats in times of trouble. Things get particularly perilous with an accusation of incastum or unchastity. If your purity has been violated, then you've put Rome in serious peril, Missy. But likewise, if a virgin riding a horse in an open field gets struck by lightning and then dies and her skirt is pulled up again over her private parts... And her uh, tongue is sticking and out. And her tongue is sticking well, that's, out. Well, that's a surefire sign that a vessel's been sleeping around. Well, chances are <laughs> something's gone wrong. Yeah. Uh. And there must be the occasional vessel who gets herself into a spot of trouble, because let's be honest... Can you imagine yourself at age 18, young and powerful and respected, sticking with a vow of chastity for what is all of your young life, potentially all your childbearing years? Maybe, if you knew it was your calling, but these girls are chosen way before it's clear whether they will be well-suited to such a role or not. These women are taken into this priesthood prior to puberty. They have no idea whether they're fit already for a life of asexuality, mm. as is essentially required from their role. Yeah. And um, so the requirement to maintain this virginity um, throughout their service could be a huge onerous burden, yeah. I think, for some I'll of them. I'll say. Yeah, <laughs> massive. I mean, you're going into it, you don't really have a choice. You're yeah. not even really sure what your body's capable of yet. Lo and behold, here you are. But this isn't just about whether or not you've been sleeping with people. Some yeah. early Vestals got into trouble for um, maybe being a little bit too luxuriously dressed. Some have got into trouble for flirtatious behavior. In 420 BCE, a Vestal named Postumia is put on trial because she dresses too fashionably and is rather too droll in casual conversation. Witty and a snappy dresser? She's probably a witch of some kind. It's not just whether you're a virgin in the strict physical sense, you also have to convey what is known as the castitas, the uh, sort of pure moral spirit of a virgin woman. Yeah, so it's a state of mind. <laughs> yeah, it's a way of being. Yeah. Um, and so some of them, because they can be invited places and they don't need a guardian and things like that, they end up moving in very sort of powerful circles. And, you know, you have too much fun at a dinner party, you get a bit flirtatious. That's a no-no as a vestal. That does not look good, and it can call the whole priesthood into disrepute and lead to an investigation. In the first century BCE, for instance, a very rich guy named Marcus Licinius Crassus almost loses his life and property because he was accused of getting a little too close to a vestal. As Plutarch tells us, he sidles on up to a vestal named Licinia because she owned a pleasant villa in the suburbs which Crassus wished to get at a low price. And it was for this reason that he was forever hovering about the woman and paying his court to her. Note here that she outright owns quite a fancy property, despite being a woman. The court acquitted him and her, which was lucky. Things don't always end so well. So, 
Sometimes vestals are just outright accused of incestum, evidence or no. If there's a political crisis going on, it's a lot more likely that a vestal is going to get caught in the anxious public crossfire. This is really worrying, because how can you conclusively prove you're still a virgin? So when a vestal named Tuchia is falsely accused of being unchaste, she gave her goddess Vesta a quick ritual call. Sup, girl. Look, some guys are giving me a hard time about whether or not I lost my V-card. Can you do me a solid? If I'm innocent, just let me carry water in a sieve up from the Tiber. That should shut up those asshats. Okay, love you, bye! Vesta answers her prayer, letting her perform a miracle, but others aren't so lucky. Livy tells us that in 337 BCE, a Vestal named Minutia comes under suspicion because of her dress, which was more ornate than became her station. She's condemned of impiety on the testimony of a slave. Remember, in Rome, a slave's status and their word is considered about as reliable as your household pets. And she's convicted and buried alive. Near the Colline Gate, to the right of the paved road in the polluted field, so called, I believe, on account of her unchastity. Pretty harsh. When a Vestal is charged with incestum, she's put on trial. If she's found guilty, it's a crime to spill a virgin's blood. What to do? So the sacrosanctitas of the Vestal is the thing that is obviously supposed to preserve their virginity. Yeah. Uh, but also means that they ritually should not be touched. So you can't like murder them with your own two hands. Yes, you should not. No. Um, that would be, that would make things, make a bad situation even, even worse. worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what you do is you leave it up to Vesta herself. Mm. Um, as the arbiter of these things. In a way that kind of we know means that you, there's only one way out. Uh, the, wow. Yeah. There's no way out. Yeah. Given that it's wrong to straight up kill a priestess, Rome figures, instead they bury her alive, breaking her up in a little underground house. The culprit herself is placed on a litter, Plutarch tells us, over which coverings are thrown and fastened down with cords so that not even a cry can be heard from within and carried through the forum. All the people there silently make way for the litter, and follow it without uttering a sound in a terrible depression of soul. No other spectacle is more appalling, nor does any other day bring more gloom to the city than this. When the litter reaches its destination, the attendants unfasten the cords of the coverings. Then the high priest, after stretching his arm towards heaven and uttering certain mysterious prayers, brings forth the culprit, who is closely veiled, and places her on the steps leading down into the chamber. They hand her down there with a little bit of light, a little bit of bread and milk, then throw dirt over the doorway and they just leave her there. If Vesta saves her, great! But if she dies of starvation in the pitch black dark, well, she must have been guilty. A pretty horrifying end. And of course this whole thing can be politically driven, as Dr. G attests. I do get one particular story from the early period, um, which, so like the early imperial period under Domitian, where the chief vestal, Cornelia, is accused of incestum on the back of Domitian apparently being upset about some stuff. We get this in a letter from Pliny, um, and he sort of makes it pretty clear from his perspective that Domitian is just being an idiot. Um, <laughs> as Domitian often is. <laughs> as Domitian often is. Yeah. Um, and anyway, so like Cornelia is accused, um, she's not even present when the accusation is made, and Domitian himself declares it and says she's guilty of this. She is horrified, and she immediately uh, calls upon the gods as a sort of defense mechanism, is to invokes the aid of Vesta, makes it pretty clear that she's like, all of the successes that Domitian has had in his reign are due to the fact that she's maintained the integrity of the Vestal Virgins precisely. But nevertheless, she's forced um, into this live burial. So forced through a public parade, um, people turn up for this kind of stuff. It's grotesque, um, but this kind of, you can't look away. Um, so she processes through public. And the story goes that she trips as she starts to go down the stairs, loses her balance slightly as she's entering the underground chamber. The executioner who's leading this sort of live burial offers his hand uh, to help her up, and she disdainfully refuses um, to allow her body to be 
besmirched in any way as like this final defiant gesture of her purity and her sanctitas um, that cannot be compromised regardless of how this is going to end. And the tragedy of this sort of moment is where... It's commitment. That's commitment. Well, well, not only has she, like... Because Cornelia is um, the chief festal as well. So, yeah. you know, presumably one of the oldest in the order at the time. Yeah. Um, living under an emperor who seems to have no respect for uh, the position or what it means. And to still be forced into this position of being buried alive is a huge tragedy. A woman targeted by a manipulative emperor who doesn't like how much power she's accrued? Not exactly a shocker, but a tragedy indeed. On that cheery note, we're going to throw some coal on Vesta's flame and wrap up this section of A Roman Woman's Day for now. In part three, we'll head out into the streets for the afternoon and evening, go to the baths and the Colosseum, go to a feast, maybe indulge in a little sensual pleasure, and talk about medicine in ancient Rome. Until next time. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, consider becoming a patron. It really helps me keep the show going, and it gives you access to exclusive deals and bonus episodes. Some of the ones coming up will include my full interviews with Dr. Rad, Dr. G, and Dr. Evans, which you won't want to miss. You can also leave me a review on Apple Podcasts, which helps new listeners find me. Another way to support the show and get yourself a fetching present is to check out the Explorers merchandise shop, where you'll find lady-centric timelines, detailed maps, and women's history greeting cards and art prints made just for you. To read the transcript for this episode, plus a full list of my research sources, lots of images, and more, just go to this episode's show notes on my website, theexplorespodcast.com. You'll also find me on Instagram and Facebook at The Explorers Podcast and Twitter at The Explorers Pod. A huge thanks to Dr. Rhiannon and Evans, Dr. Rad, and Dr. G for going time traveling with us. If you want to hear more from them about ancient Rome, look no further than their podcasts, The Partial historians and emperors of Rome. That last produced by Matt Smith. You'll find links to both shows in the show notes. The music you just enjoyed comes courtesy of Michael Levy, who composes music using recreated lyres from antiquity to give us beautiful glimpses into the ancient world. To find out more about his work, check out the show notes. Thanks as always to Mr. Explores, Paul Goblonsky, for my theme music, logo, and the amazing graphics he keeps patiently making for the Explorers. And thanks to the following legends for their vocal stylings. Phil Chevalier, John Armstrong, Sean from the excellent podcast Stories of Your and Yours, Paul Gablonski, Simon Denatris, Avery Downing, and Ray from the Woman's Planning Podcast. 